kasihmu sempurna nyata dalam hidupku ku
Yesus Kebaikanmu tidak pernah habis-habis ya Tuhan Kami katakan Ku bersyukur Ku bersyukur Tuhan Ku bersyukur Tuhan Amin Buat kasih setia the 
Shalom, dear brothers and sisters. Let us prepare our heart to worship the Lord together. The psalmist declares from Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Come, let us pray. Abba, Father. We are gathered here to sing unto you, O Lord God, and to proclaim the greatness of your name. For you are the great King, the sovereign Lord and Creator. We are the people of your pasture, the sheep of your hand, and we bring our songs of praise and worship unto you. In the different homes we are gathering here today, we pray, O Lord Jesus, that your love will bind us together in oneness of heart. With one another in one service, we ask that each of us will encounter you in a fresh manner today, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it Then it's all Come, let us pray. We thank you so much that we can be gathered here in this manner on the online church platform to worship you and to hear your word. We want to join our hearts together with everyone wherever they may be meeting and we want to present the tithes and offerings to you. May you use it for the extension of your church and for the works of ministry throughout the church. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And now, let us prepare our hearts to hear God's word. Good morning, church. Uh, it is good to be back again and uh, this time I'm bringing the message on the third part of the book of Romans and my topic is Are You Right With God? And uh, I'm so thankful for the church for giving me this topic but it's also a big challenge because I'm doing roughly about two and a half chapters of Romans from chapter 3 verse 21 to the end of chapter 5. But before I begin, there is something I need to uh, say and that is uh, the way we deal with this topic, our thinking of God affects our relationship with Him. And this is the danger of secularism. And secularism is a thinking that man 
is at the centre of the universe. Secular thinking focuses on men rather than God. This way of thinking is, is doing big injury to the Christian faith. Now, if we have thought that it is only the atheists or non-believers have this kind of idea, let me tell you that it has also affected Christians. Christians are affected by secular mindset and it comes in a, with a slight difference. For example, a Christian mind is affected with a difference. Uh, firstly, a Christian is not hostile. He has a secular mind, but he's not hostile to God or to the Bible. A Christian is not blind to new scientific and archaeological discoveries. But his philosophy of God focuses on man's right and not on God's right. Let me give you a few examples. Some of their silent philosophy that they have in their mind. For example, they will say, uh, has God the right to discipline or punish us? Has God the right to demand righteousness from His people? Has God the right to send Jesus Christ to die on the cross? Can God kill His own Son? What is this? So in the mind of a Christian, while they may not uh, speak out openly, it's in their thinking. And their thinking can also come in this way that is Jesus the only way? There may be others. And so this secular mindset that affects the Christian begins with their thinking about God. Now with that cleared, I hope our mind can be sanitized this morning so that we will be able, as we go to the passage, to understand what it's all about. Now, let me read the passage to you. For I just read a couple of uh, verses from chapter 3, verse 21 and, uh, to 25. And this has been uh, proclaimed as the, one of the most important uh, passages of Scripture in the book of Romans. Now, it goes like this. Verse 21 begins, But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He has left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at the present time so as to be the just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your word, open our minds, open our thoughts, so that we can think correctly and rightly with regard to your word, and let our thinking be sanitized, so that, Lord, we will think of the right way. So, Father, we commit ourselves to you, and I pray, God, that you will increase in my life, that I may decrease, and let the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, to do this passage, I've broken them up into uh, four uh, points. First point is, what is righteousness? All right? To be right with God, we must know what it means. Since the scripture talks about this righteousness apart from the law. Apart from the law, is uh, given to us. So we must know what is this righteousness. Then the next question we ask is, well, if this is righteousness, how do we get it? How do we get God's righteousness? And how God's righteousness is assured in us? And finally, the blessings that comes with God's righteousness. So let's begin. So firstly, what is righteousness? Well, Webster Dictionary defined for us that it is acting according to 
divine moral law. Free, and then we'll be free from guilt and sin. But we need to know what is the biblical definition. And the biblical definition uh, is that the, the word righteousness has a same root word as the word justice of God. Justice, justice. And William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig is a professor of the Houston Baptist Seminary. He's a professor of philosophy, uh, theology, and he's well equipped. And he says this, uh, that uh, the way we understand God is that God must be the paradigm, the locus, the, the source of all moral values and standard. And then he begins to say, well, righteousness in God's eyes include four things. One, it is character. Secondly, it is conscience. Thirdly, it is your conduct, your behaviour. And lastly, it's command, which is simply obedience to the word of God. Now, these are the ways that God wants us to behave, to do, if we are to be righteous in His sight. Unfortunately, in all these four areas, we fail God. And because we fail God, God punishes us with guilt and sin. And in all these areas, we have offended God. The Bible call it sin in us. So, with righteousness from God is so important, how do we get it? How do we receive this righteousness? How did it come to us? Well, the next point is this. How do we get this righteousness? There are two ways to be right with God. Two ways. There are two ways. And basically, the first way is by keeping or obeying the law. And last week, you have the sermon on bad news. All the things that, uh, that we are not supposed to do. And it's from uh, chapter 1, verse 18, right up to uh, chapter 3, verse 19. And the summing up of this uh, uh, bad news or the things that we are able to keep is summed up in uh, chapter 3, verse 20. And it is re written this way. Therefore, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by keeping the law. No one. So it's very clear that by keeping the law, no one is being able to uh, be right with God. And in chapter 3, verse 10, it says, There is no one righteous, not even one. Now, we ask ourselves, Keeping the law was written mainly for the Jews. How does it affect us who are not who are non-Jews? So for us, keeping the law is actually to gain God's favor. We gain God's favor through a few things. And they are doing good works, they are penance and offering sacrifices. Now, what happened is this: good works that we do can never meet God's standard. If God's standard is 100%, then we find that whatever we do, we, we cannot reach it. Maybe it's 99.9, .9, yet we still fail. And I think there's no one greater in doing good works than Mother Teresa. She has done much, but she still realized that she is a sinner before God. Now, there's another area where we call penance. No amount of penance will, can satisfy God. Now, what is penance? Penance actually are human activities designed to please God. And so what do we do? We pierce our bodies, we whip our body, we, uh, we put pressure, we make our body painful, we crawl in order to please God and say, God, you know how much I've suffered, you know how much I've crawled and how much I've beaten my body, how much I've pierced my body with knives and, and, and uh, needles. God, please accept me. But we know that these type of things cannot make us right before God, cannot satisfy God. And the last one, of course, we are very familiar is we offer sacrifices. And our sacrifices that we offer, whether Jews or Gentiles, we offer sacrifices. Asian, of course, uh, to please God, sometimes they offer a chicken 
and if the richer they might afford a lamb or a goat or a bull and to, by doing this they hope that it will be acceptable, acceptable to God unfortunately we cannot do it all the time secondly the offering that we made to God the, the animals that we kill are imperfect and so it is not acceptable to God to make us right with Him so therefore all this keeping of the law did not meet God's standard. And scripture has a word to say that in verse 23 of chapter 3, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I say there is two ways. Now, therefore, the first way keeping the law is out for us. Whether we try to gain favor through good works, penance, or offering sacrifice, it's not, we are not able to be right with God. So, what is the other way? Well, the other way is God's. Uh, by faith in Jesus Christ, by faith in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And this one you find in chapter 3, and you find it in verse uh, 24. And, and, and in the verse 24, there are a few words that I need to say, how did Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, save us? Through, uh, through what, what kind of uh, uh, words that Paul used? Okay, verse 24, it says, we are justified freely. The first word is justified freely by His grace through the redemption. So second word we need to understand is, what is redemption? And that came by Christ Jesus and presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement. And so the third word is atonement that we know, alright? So we have faith in Jesus Christ's sacrificial death, right? And then the first one is through justification. What is justification? Justification is that all our sins are pardoned through faith in Jesus Christ. It is something like this. It's like uh, you drive down the road and you are caught with speeding and the fine is a, a big fine. And then you go to a friend and say, hey, friend, can you help me? You know, this speeding uh, ticket that I have. I know you know some judges. You know, and if you can talk to them, maybe they will forgive me and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, forgive of my speeding fine. Then a week later, you met your friend and you say, Hey, have you, paid my, have you solved your, my speeding ticket problem? And the friend said, No, 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 no. Actually, I paid on your behalf. I paid on your behalf. You are now scot-free. You don't have to go to the jail. Now, this is exactly what justification is. God found us guilty. We are sinners. Richard Toh is a sinner. But Jesus Christ came and said, I've taken your sin upon me by myself offering to God. So that is justification. Another word Paul uses was the word redemption. What is redemption? Redemption, I put that simply, is to buy back. Buy back, Jesus buy back our sin by His blood. In other words, he, of course by His death, He died, but the blood is used to buy back our sin. So this is how we are redeemed. And the third word Paul uses was through atonement. Now, the word atonement, of course, is the Old Testament word. And every year, once a year, in the, in the atonement, day of atonement, uh, the high priest will go into the ark and then he will sprinkle blood on the, uh, on the ark. He's, in other words, saying, the sin of these people has been covered. Sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we talk about screen of atonement, actually there are two aspects, there are two words that come to it. And I put down these two words as propitiation and expiation. Now this is a big word. What do they actually mean? They are very simple. To propitiate means to appease, to nullify God's wrath. Because we are sinners, God is angry with us, His wrath is poured out on us, and propitiation is Jesus' death, nullify. Appease God's wrath. What is expiation? Expiation is simply the removal of my sin by Jesus' death on the cross. The removal of my sin. So these two words uh, uh, have about a similar meaning. And in some of your version, they will use the word propitiation. Some of your version will use the word atonement. Some of the version will use the word expiation. But all these words have this meaning that when Jesus Christ atoned for our sin. First of all, He propitiated, He appeased God. 
nullify God's wrath upon us. And secondly, He expiates our sin. In other words, He takes away, removes our sin by His death on the cross. Now, the question we ask is, why did God want to do this? Scripture tells us He do it in order to de demonstrate His justice, that He is both the one who is the just and the justifier of all who have faith in Jesus. You see, in other words, God says, those who have done in the past, uh, who have done wrong, you know, I would also, in a sense, justify them, forgiven them when Jesus came into the world. So, so he says this, that God did it in order to be the just and the justifier of all of our sin. Now, when we hear this, what does it mean to us? Well, it means to us that God is doing everything. There's nothing I can do. Richard told there's nothing you can do to please God. God has to come to us. God has to provide us with a solution. So there is really nothing for us to boast. There's nothing I do you know, to gain God's favour. It's God who has shown His favour upon me. So there's nothing, to, it's all of God's doing and there's nothing for us, for me to boast. And at this particular point, I want to challenge the audience. Because some of you here may not have known Jesus Christ. Some of you have, uh, have not uh, received Jesus. I know every Sunday, the preacher, before he ends, he will challenge you to receive Jesus. But this morning now, you know why? Because of God's love to you, that now He wants you to come back to Himself. And that's why God say, for God so loved the world, so loved, He loved the world so much that He sent Jesus in order to take our place. We are sinful people and as we come to Jesus, we know that God will forgive us. So it's very simple. So what do we do? What is our choice? Our choice is simply to say, Lord Jesus, I thank you, you died on the cross. I thank you that you're forgiven of my sin. Come into my life to be my Lord and Saviour. Now, I, now you know why it's so important that our mind needs to be clean. Because if you have a secular mind, you begin to think, how can this be? How can God send and kill His Son on the cross? This is cosmic abuse. I mean, some of you may have heard this word. But actually, God do it for our sake because God loved us so much. And uh, there's much we can talk, but because I want to focus on the message. Now, we say, how do we get this righteousness? Keeping the law is no good, but only by faith in Jesus Christ, we then get this righteousness. What is transmitted to us now? Yes, God died. We are, we, we are declared uh, righteous before God, but what do we get? What is transmitted to us? And here, the second part is said, God's righteousness is assured in us. Paul has to give a few examples. And he draws the example actually from chapter 4 of Romans, of Romans. And he first of all, the first proof he gave was Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. It's in verse 9. All right, part of verse 9, he says that uh, we have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as in righteousness. And then if you read verse 23 and 24, it is also say that it was also, this righteousness was also credited to us. In other words, God put this righteousness into our life. Now, he used another example. He used David. Second proof, he says it's David. And uh, it's actually verses 4, uh, 4 to 8 or 5 to 8. And uh, David gave an example from Psalm where he says, all your transgression, transgression or your sin has been forgiven. And God says, I will not remember your sin anymore. And your sin is covered. And uh, David then made this comment in verse 6. David say the same thing when he speak of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness. God credit righteousness. So David says, God credit righteousness to one who has faith in God. And then the last one, of course, is found in chapter 5. 
it is not so clear, but I think it has the same meaning. For example, in verse 17 of chapter 5, it says this, huh? I, I have paraphrased them and cut short. It says here, the sin of one man, Adam. So Paul moved from Abraham, who is not a Jew, to David, who is a Jew, and then to Adam, who is our first man. And it says, in Adam, the sin of Adam, death reigned. And the art and the gift of righteousness in one man, Jesus, life reigned. In other words, Adam brought sin, Jesus brought life, eternal life into, into us. Now, this crediting of righteousness to us give rise to the idea of imputation. And Paul has this idea when he wrote uh, Romans chapter 4. And I think the best explanation of imputation actually comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And it's a very familiar and popular verse. God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who has no sin, to be sin for us. God made Jesus Christ to be sin, who has no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might, in Jesus Christ, might become the righteousness of God. In other words, we inherit God's righteousness. And this is what imputation is about. Now, in other words, God's righteousness is transmitted, is credited to us through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, this idea of imputation is very important because someone say, since Jesus has forgiven me of my sin, justify me of my sin, all my sins have been pardoned, my past, my present, my future sin has been all been forgiven, then I can do anything I want. I can just live and, and, and do all the wrong things and I'll be okay because God will forgive. Ah, when God impute the righteousness into you, He also enables you to live righteously. And so, the Methodists have a, have a wonderful explanation. The Methodist says, you know, both imputation and impartation of righteousness comes together so that God puts His righteousness inside us. But when He imparts righteousness to us, it is to enable us to live righteously, to live a life that will be pleasing to God. Now, of course, there is another group of people that have a different idea of imputation, and uh, they are the Catholics. They, in, they believe in infused righteousness, which simply means that we can... Uh, uh, it, is, it is effected through the church and through confession. So as we come, so the, the Catholic idea is totally different. In other words, the church becomes so important that we must come to the church for forgiveness and for taking uh, uh, to be right with God. But evangelicals believe that both the imputation of righteousness and the impartation of righteousness come into us so that we can live a life that is pleasing to God. But my question asks, what kind of faith do you have? Yes, God has done all this, but what kind of faith do you have? Do you, do you have a token of faith? Do you have a fake faith? Do you speak like a Christian, act like a Christian, but you are not really a believer? Your mind has not changed about what who God is? Do you just profess to be a Christian or do you possess your life to be a Christian? Is there a profession of faith or is it a possession of your faith? Finally, number four, we come to the blessings that come with righteousness and that comes in chapter five. As you believe in Jesus, you are right with God, righteousness comes on you, then you have this blessing. And what is this blessing? First of all, chapter five tells us that Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, justified by faith in Jesus Christ, what do you have? One, peace with God. What is peace with God? It means now you are reconciled back to God and you can, call, you can call God your Father. Secondly, you have access to God. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. You can come to God directly. 
and pray to Him. And then He says here, Rejoice in the glory of God. What is this? Rejoice in the glory of God. It simply means enjoy God's presence. Psalm 16 says, you know, at His right hand and in His presence, there is fullness of joy. As we come into the presence of God, it is always tremendous joyfulness in us. And then he says here, rejoice in suffering. What is this rejoice in suffering? It's in the evidence that you are God's child. Right? And the first thing in the suffering, he says, when you are suffering, it produces, in, uh, suffering produces certain things. And in fact, there are a couple of things that suffering produces. One, you find it is perseverance. Perseverance is actually a sort of endurance of a person who endured with a purpose and loyalty to faith in Jesus Christ in the greatest of trial. In other words, in the most difficult situation, the person uh, has a purpose and remain loyal to, to God even upon his death. That is perseverance. And then and perseverance gives rise to character. Character is simply makes you more proven in character, you are tried, you are strengthened, you are stable, you are consistent all right, in your walk with God. And of course, the last one is hope. Hope that is undergirded by God's love, sealed by the Holy Spirit. I'll talk a bit more about this hope. And then the second part of it is the promised hope. Now, the promised hope here, I just quoted the thing from uh, the life of Abraham here. And I just read to you here, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, not wavering in unbelief, but was strengthened, and his faith, and, and fully persuaded that God has power to do what he has promised. Faith, hope without faith, is wishful thinking. It's blind. It's blind. Hope without love, is an extreme form of self-egotism. Hope without love is a form of extreme self-egotism. But what is real hope? And the second part here is, I quoted here, our hope-filled faith is thinking positively of the outcome. Now, it is not positive thinking, right? Hope is not positive thinking. Positive thinking is keep on repeating to yourself, things will happen, uh, things will happen well, happen well, everything okay, everything okay, no. Thinking positively of the outcome is thinking God's word, is thinking God's mind of what's going to happen. And I think a, a good illustration is come from Tim Keller, and he says two guys walking to the bank because uh, the bank want to foreclose their home uh, because they couldn't pay their mortgage. So two men was walking down the road and, uh, and, and, and they were sad because, you know, they're going to lose their home. But one man suddenly received, I call him Tom. Tom suddenly received a call and the call came and the, and the guy said, Hey Tom, I just want to let you know that your debt has been fully paid. And uh, I want you now to walk to the bank and there I want you to sign a document that you can be released from this. Now, these two men who walked down the road, initially they were very troubled. Initially they were very sad. But when Tom received the news that his dad has been paid, what do you think is happening in Tom's life? I think Tom will be joyful. He will be, there will be a sense of like an unbelief. How can this happen? How can this happen? And he walked. So Tom, as he goes to the bank, he will be, there is a different feeling. All right, in him, and there will be different thinking in him now that he knows his debt has been settled. But the other guy, of course, is sad. The other guy has nothing, and therefore, you know, he 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 just goes and try his best to talk to the bank manager to solve his problem. Now, this is exactly what Tim Keller says. He says God put in us the hope that we have an eternal life. That we need not, to, if anything happened to us, we have a life to live on. We will live on and on. We don't have to despair because God says, I would one day come and take you back and give you a position, a place where even your mind cannot conceive what it is to be like in the kingdom of God. You will rule 
and reign with me. So Jesus is trying to say is, yes, in this life we have problems and difficulties. But I want to let you know that if you are the if you are thinking positively about God, you know, God has your best interests in his heart. And so with that, you know, you, you have a feeling that God is doing well for you. God is on your side. Now, thirdly, you find in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, 10, 15, 17, all have this. Because of our faith in Christ, we are privileged to how much more blessing? In other words, if the death of Christ gives you blessing and, that, and Jesus is alive, how much more? Great thing in the area of gifting, in the area of graces, in the area of favour, I just leave it to you. In fact, I just leave out the question, what are these, how much more blessings that you would have? And finally, let's ask ourselves three questions so that you can discuss it in your group. The first question is, to obtain righteousness of God, we are to have faith in Jesus. Discuss how profession of faith or possession of faith determines how you live. Secondly, how are you able to rejoice in suffering? How? Or what are the, the, the terms Paul used for our salvation? Thirdly, thirdly is, a, is a quote from Anne Graham Lotz, the daughter of Billy Graham. She has gone through many difficulties with her brother, other siblings. And uh, she says this, huh? Abraham was not perfect. He failed, he made mistakes, but he would go back, get right with God and just keep moving on. He did not quit when things go hard. He just kept going. And everywhere he went, God was there. God was with him. My question is, how would you understand hope now? I trust you've been blessed this morning with the message and may God bless you. Let's bow our head for the word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We praise you for your goodness. We pray that your word will strengthen us. Your word will encourage us. Your word will help us, Lord, to know that, our, that we are secured. That we, we who have truly believed in you, we know we will be with you one day. So God, we commit ourselves to you now. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. God bless you, church.
river be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he's with you he's with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he's for you Dear brothers and sisters, as we depart from here, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. See you again. God bless you, everyone. Take care and stay safe.